Got it. All righty. Uh, so welcome to the mandatory fun of clarity training. I'm going to share my screen. I have a presentation that I would like to share with you. It's actually done by our um, campus safety officer, Lauren Bailey. She does a very good job. It's about 20 minutes long. Hello and welcome to the Clary X Campus Security Authority. Can everybody hear that? My name is Lauren Sullivan and I am a campus safety officer here at Regis University. As a campus safety officer, I have been involved in responding to various situations across our campus. And part of my job is to identify Clary Act crimes that must be classified and categorized for statistical purposes and evaluated for immediate and time. timely warning notifications for the Regis community. The information presented in this session. Oh, Hello and welcome to the Clary X Campus yeah. Security Authority training. <clears throat> My name is Lauren Sullivan and I am a campus safety officer here at Regis University. As a campus safety officer, I have been involved in responding to various situations across our campus, and part of my job is to identify Clary Act crimes that must be classified and categorized for statistical purposes, and evaluated for immediate and timely warning notifications for the Regis community. The information presented in this session is an integral part of the Clary Act. The purpose of this presentation is to ensure that you, as a campus security authority, understand your role and responsibilities as it pertains to Clary compliance. The Clary Act is a federal law named after Jean Clary, who was a victim of murder while attending a university. Holistically, the Clary Act is a consumer protection law that aims to provide transparency around an institution's crime policies and crime statistics. This law requires Regis University to report crime statistics, safety and security information, and policies to current and prospective students and employees. As mentioned earlier, compliance with this federal law is important because failure for non-compliance can result in a monetary fine. Currently, the fine amount is just over $59,000 for each violation. This presentation will cover the following topics. Clery Act Overview and Requirements, Campus Security Authority Roles and Responsibilities, Clery Crimes, and Clery Geography. There will be a short quiz at the conclusion of this presentation that helps us to assess that this information was understood. Non-compliance and fines. The following are all examples of non-compliance that will result in a monetary fine for the university. CSA's failure to report crimes to the designated office that is responsible for evaluating and classifying crimes. The designated office that is responsible is campus safety. Crimes not being evaluated for immediate or timely warning notifications. Crimes not being annotated in the daily crime law. Or crimes not listed in the annual security report. These are just some of the many examples of violations that result in monetary fines from the Department of Education. Title IV institutions are those who collect federal funding. Regis University is a Title IV school and is required to comply with the Clary Act. There are many requirements in the Clary Act and these are a few that pertain to this class. Collect, classify, and categorize crime reports. Basically, campus safety evaluates a crime and determines what crime category the crime falls under. Maintain a daily crime log. The crime log will list all crimes for the past 60 days. Issue campus alerts. Campus alerts are called timely warnings and immediate notifications. In some cases, they are required for Clary Act crimes. <coughs> Publish an annual security report. The annual security report is where the Clary crimes are listed for the previous three years. Submit crime statistics to the U.S. Department of Education. Campus Security Authority's purpose and responsibilities are 
to collect query crime information to include allegations of crimes that are reported to you. To send crime reports to the Campus Safety Department, who is the designated office that collects crime reports. Why have a CSA? Some crimes, especially sex offenses, are often not reported to the police or campus people. Some individuals will instead report crimes to universities, faculty, or staff. As a campus security authority, you are a mandatory reporter, which means you do not have a choice as to whether or not to report a crime to campus safety. Bear in mind, the Clary Act is concerned about the what and the where, which means what crime occurred and where did the crime take place? If a person does not want their name in a report, as a campus security authority, you can report the following information to campus safety. Crime type, location within the Clary geography, we will discuss geography later in this presentation, and the date and time of the crime. This information ensures that the crime is categorized, evaluated properly, and added into the daily crime log in the correct manner and in the proper time frame. Campus security authorities are responsible for reporting crimes to campus safety, including allegations of Clary Act crimes that are reported to them while they are in their capacity as a campus security authority. In other words, you are not required to report the crime under the following circumstances. One, if you overhear of an incident in a hallway, cafeteria, etc. Two, if a classmate mentions a crime during an in-class discussion. Three, if a victim mentions an incident during a speech, workshop, or any other form of group presentation. Four, any incident that you otherwise learn about in an indirect manner. Under these circumstances, you are not required to report the crime. What you want to do as a campus security authority. Collect crime report information. Complete crime report forms. Crimes reported must be conveyed to campus safety. There are various ways to report crimes. First, you can contact campus safety and we will come to you to take a report. Second, on our campus safety webpage, we have online reporting capability. There is also a campus security authority crime reporting form. If these methods are unavailable, you may send an email to safety at regis.edu. If the crime or event is serious and there is a continuing threat to the university community, do not delay in contacting campus safety directly. As a CSA, a priority is to ensure the care of the victim. Ask the victim the following. Do they need medical attention? Do they need you to call 911 for help? Do they need resources such as counseling, Title IX, or other departments? Do they need interim safety measures such as safety escorts, housing reassignment, class rescheduling, et cetera? Lastly, you can ask if they want to report the crime to campus safety or to law enforcement. Assist the victim as necessary. Actions to avoid. Do not attempt to determine whether or not a crime took place. When the crime is reported in good faith, it is considered to be a crime. Do not convince or force a victim to report the crime to campus safety or to law enforcement. Reporting the crime to campus safety or law enforcement is their choice. Do not try to apprehend the perpetrator. This rule is for your safety. The Clary Act does not differentiate between attempted or completed crimes. Alleged crimes must be reported. Crimes that are reported do not have to be proven in court, by a magistrate, or by a jury. Before we go into the types of crimes, be aware that the Clary Act does not require statistical counting for crimes in businesses, even if we own the property or in private homes. This would include the businesses at Regis Square and the private homes that we do not own or control within our Clary geography. In other words, those crimes would not be listed in our statistical crime charts. There are seven primary crimes listed under the Clary Act. Murder, non-negligent manslaughter is defined as the willful, non-negligent killing of one human being by another. 
Manslaughter by negligence is the killing of another person through gross negligence. Sexual assault is the next primary crime and it includes four sex offenses. Males and females can be both victims and perpetrators of sexual assault. Rape is the penetration, no matter how slight, of the vagina or anus with any body part or object or oral penetration by a sex organ of another person without the consent of the victim. Include the crime as rape regardless of the age of the victim, if the victim did not consent, and if the victim was incapable of giving consent. Fondling is the touching of the private body parts of another person for the purpose of sexual gratification without consent of the victim. The Clary Act does not limit the private parts to breast, crotch, and buttocks. This crime takes into consideration the totality of actions that occurred during the situation. The last two sex offenses are non-forcible. The term non-forcible means that the act is consensual but prohibited by law. Incest is defined as intercourse between persons who are related to each other with the degrees wherein marriage is prohibited by law. By definition, incest is a consensual act. If the threat or use of force exists, then this is classified as rape, not incest. Statutory rape is defined as sexual intercourse with a person who is under the statutory age of consent. Statutory rape is consensual. If the threat or use of force exists, then it is classified as rape. In general, in Colorado, statutory rape is when the victim is less than 15 years of age and the actor is at least four years older than the victim. Robbery is defined as the taking or attempting to take anything of value from the care, custody, or control of a person or persons by force or threat of force or violence and or by putting the victim in fear. Aggravated assault is defined as an unlawful attack by one person upon another for the purpose of inflicting severe or aggravated bodily injury. Burglary. Burglary is defined as the unlawful entry of a structure to commit a felony or a theft. Burglary can occur in a room, office, building, or one of the sheds that we have on campus. Motor vehicle theft the theft or attempted theft of a motor vehicle. If someone breaks into a vehicle and tampers with the ignition, but fails to steal the vehicle, that is considered motor vehicle theft. Joyriding is motor vehicle theft. Arson. Arson is defined as any willful or malicious burning or attempt to burn with or without intent to defraud a dwelling, house, public building, motor vehicle, or aircraft personal property of another, etc. The size or the intent of the fire is not considered. For example, if someone intentionally lights a paper on a bulletin board on fire as a joke, it is considered arson. Hate crimes. Report those offenses that manifest evidence that the victim was intentionally selected because of the perpetrator's bias against the victim. The eight biases outlined in the Clery Act are as follows. Race, religion, ethnicity, gender identity, gender, sexual orientation, disability, national origin. Although Clary only counts the eight mentioned hate crimes, be sure to report any type of bias that may occur. Hate crimes. The following crimes are not statistically counted in the Clary Act unless they occur in conjunction with a hate crime. Larceny, theft, simple assault, intimidation, destruction, damage, and or vandalism of property. For example, if a person is slapped in the face and called a racial epithet, that would be included in our annual security report as a simple assault hate crime based on race. The next set of crimes comes from the Violence Against Women Act. Domestic violence is defined as a felony or misdemeanor crime of violence that is committed by one of the following. A, a current or former spouse or intimate partner of the victim. B, a person with whom the victim shares a child. 
C, a person who is cohabitating with or has cohabitated with the victim as a spouse or intimate partner. D, a person similarly situated to a spouse of the victim under the domestic or family violence laws of the jurisdiction in which the crime of violence occurred. Or E, any other person against an adult or youth victim who is protected from that person's act under the domestic or family violence laws of the jurisdiction in which the crime of violence occurred. Dating violence. Dating violence is defined as violence committed by a person who is or has been in a relationship of a romantic or intimate nature with the victim. Dating violence includes, but is not limited to, sexual or physical abuse or the threat of such abuse. Dating violence does not include acts covered under the definition of domestic violence. Stalking is defined as engaging in a course of conduct directed at a specific person that would cause a reasonable person to fear for the person's safety or the safety of others or suffer substantial emotional distress. In this context, course of conduct means two or more acts, including but not limited to acts in which the stalker directly, indirectly, or through third parties by any action, method, device, or means follows, monitors, observes, surveils, threatens, or communicates to or about a person or interferes with a person's property. One of the courses of conduct must be conducted on our Clary geography. Substantial emotional distress can manifest in many ways, including difficulty eating or sleeping, anxiety or nervousness, nightmares, increased drug and alcohol use, Stomach aches and headaches from stress of experiencing stalking, decreased ability to perform at school or work or to accomplish daily tasks, frustration, irritability, anger, shock, or confusion, feeling on guard or hypervigilant, changing routines, depression. Arrest and disciplinary referrals. Arrests and or referrals for liquor, drug, and weapon law violations that are reported to a CSA must be included in the Clary statistics. Statistical reporting is only for referrals and arrests for law violations, not policy violations. We cannot refer a guest for discipline in the residence halls or even on campus. For example, there are times we have guests who are in violation of a law, such as an alcohol law violation. In this case, try to get the information for statistical reporting. In the above example, this would be the name and age or date of birth, which will aid us in classifying the law violations, such as underage drinking or contributing to the delinquency of a minor. We are now going to discuss Regis's Clery Geography. It is limited to three categories. On-campus property. This includes any building or property that is on our campus and that is owned by Regis University. This also includes property that Regis owns but is controlled by another person or business, such as Bon Appetit, Rico, Copy, Print, and Mailroom, and the Follett's Bookstore because they support the institution. This does not include property owned by Regis that is leased to private businesses, such as the restaurants and businesses at Regis Square. Non-campus property. Any building or property owned or controlled by a student organization that is officially recognized by the institution or any building or property owned or controlled by the institution that is used in direct support of the institution's educational purposes and is not considered to be part of the main campus. Public property. All public property, including thoroughfares, streets, sidewalks, and parking facilities that is within the campus or immediately adjacent to and accessible from the campus fall in the public property category. Regis University has a combination of private and public property that campus safety must take into consideration. If you are not sure that a crime took place within the Clary geography, just report the crime to campus safety and we will make the determination. <clears throat> On the previous slide, I introduced the words control and ownership, and I need to clarify these terms. 
Ownership means our institution owns the property and buildings. Control means that our institution directly or indirectly rents, leases, or has some other type of written agreement authorizing Regis to use the space. To control a space or property does not require Regis to make a payment. A written agreement can be a formal one such as a lease agreement or an informal one such as a letter or an email for the use of a building or property or a portion of a building or property. For example, if Regis has permission via email to utilize an office space for two months with no fee that is more than a mile from campus to be used as an art studio, it meets the requirement of control in the non-campus category. All crimes at this location must be reported to campus safety and law enforcement as applicable. Now we are going to look at our Clariac geography. Each of the maps show how we define our Clariac geography for each of our separate campuses. On our maps, the red outline designates the core campus. Yellow outlines designate public property and red shading designates businesses. On our Northwest Denver campus map, the green line that runs from left to right across the campus is the border between Denver County and Adams County. We add Adams County to our geography because we have theme houses that are owned by Regis and students who live in those houses that are located in Adams County. This is the Thornton campus's Clary geography. The red outline identifies the core campus. The yellow shaded area indicates public property. This is the Denver Tech Center's Clary geography. The red outline identifies the core campus. The yellow shaded area indicates public property. Get the facts. What crime occurred? When did the crime occur? When did the person report it to you? Where did the crime occur? Be sure to convey all crimes that occurred in an incident. For example, if a person was sexually assaulted and their purse and laptop were stolen from their room and their vehicle was also stolen, each of these crimes must be reported to campus safety. Although the crimes reported may not show in the annual report, they will appear on the daily crime log. The process of how crimes are categorized and statistically counted can be convoluted due to many nuances within the Clery Act. Campus safety has the responsibility of sorting it out. You must report the crime if it occurred anywhere on campus, including residence halls, buildings, parking lots, etc. On public property that is adjacent to and accessible from campus. On non campus property owned or controlled by the institution or a recognized student organization. These are some important reminders. If the victim does not want to report to police, inform him or her that you are obligated to report the incident, but can do so as an anonymous statistic without identifying anyone. Do not attempt to convince or force the victim to file a report with police. That is their choice. Your role is to report, not determine if the crime was committed. Do not try to apprehend the perpetrator. Complete a crime report form and submit it to campus safety. There are many complicated protocols when it comes to the Clery Act. Remember, when in doubt, confer with campus safety. This concludes the Campus Security Authority training. Thank you for your time. Understanding your reporting responsibility is imperative to compliance with the Clery Act. If you have questions about the information presented, please call the Assistant Director of Campus Safety, Ed Perez at 303-458-3585 or email him at eperez at regis.edu. Okay, that's the presentation uh, for this year. Two notes, uh, there is no test. The presentation that you just saw was supposed to be part of the online training that I'm trying to get established I'm waiting for approval from IT to use the software. Uh, so that'll be next year.
Uh, number two, the handbook that was rescinded last October, which gives us regulatory guidelines on how to collect crimes, uh, was shelved by the Department of Education. Uh, with the change of an administration, I understand that the handbook is going to be updated and brought back. So how this is important to you as in athletics is that, uh, again, be sure you track uh, your locations that you go to that are out of town at hotels or out of state, because I'll be asking for that information. Is there any questions that I could answer? All right. Thank you, Ed. Appreciate taking the time to do that for us. No problem. Glad to do it. Thank you. Yep. And as you guys heard, that's why I harass you for the itineraries over and over. So please make sure that I and Philip are getting those itineraries because I have to keep a log and a spreadsheet of every hotel we stay at, every gym we play in, uh, because the Department of Education requires to know all of our locations for not only you guys, but for all of our student athletes. So that's an annual log that I have to do from January 1 to December 31. So please make sure you get me itineraries um, anytime you're traveling on the road. Not recruiting specific, really, I just need your team travel itineraries. All right, so that concludes CSA Cleary Act training. I will turn it over to Carol. Let me find your screen. Make you a co-host. All right. Carol, are you comfortable with me leaving the recording going? Yeah, for sure. All right. um, hi, everybody. Thanks for attending today. Um, we don't have a, a slide deck today. We just are going to go over some things. And I want this to be more of an opportunity for question and answer and just some updates. Um, so please don't hesitate to um, try to chime in with a question. I don't. I can't see everyone all at once because there's a lot of you. Um, or you can also type it into the chat if you have a question. Okay. So um, I am here, um, and I think Katie is here somewhere. Um, Katie Brown, are you on? Well, uh, she will I be. See her. Um, she'll be on. So I just talked to her this morning. So anyways, my name is Carol Goddard. I am the um, Equal Opportunity Title IX Coordinator at Regis. Um, and we are required to provide um, training just like uh, you had training on um, campus security authorities um, every year to all of you and all of your student athletes. So today I'm gonna share a couple of different things. Um, I gave Kate a packet that she's gonna share with all of you and we'll refer to it throughout the presentation, but. Um, it contains a process flow chart um, as far as any kind of discrimination, harassment, sexual misconduct, retaliation, bias incidents, um, kind of how that works to give you a better look at that. Um, updated resources. So if you have resources um, from before, just kind of replace them with this because they're updated and have some additional things. Um, Katie's going to go over that a little bit more. Um, I included the student training so you can see what we are training your student athletes on. And then Something that you probably or you may already have is I just included in that um, in that packet the NCAA SSI sexual uh, sexual violence prevention toolkit manual, um, and so it's just for all for your reference. Um, so what I'll do first is um, go over kind of what it is that we really make, we have to make sure that we talk to you all about every every year. Um, so one, uh, one thing is, is that we have to um, ensure that you all comply with campus authorities to ensure that all athletic staff, coach administrators and student athletes maintain a hostile free environment for all student athletes, regardless, regardless of gender, sexual orientation and know and follow campus protocol for reporting incidents of sexual violence, um, reporting immediately in, in a timely manner any suspected sexual violence to appropriate campus offices for investigation and adjudication. So my office is the office that handles any kind of investigation um, and um, that whole process basically until it gets to the sanctioning time. Um, so with the new regulations, when we have an investigation, we automatically have to have a live hearing, which is rather involved. And that's a new set of things we have to do um, where we have to have advisors, um, 
and cross-examination and things like that. Um, just like Ed was saying, that might change with the new administration, but no changes have gone in place yet. So if and when it does, I'll share that with you all. But for now, we're still following our same protocol from, um, from last year when we did this last time. Um, so some ways that you need to comply with this is, first of all, um, we kind of look at things as a, like a prevention um, remedy and then um, the investigation kind of like an answering to something. We want to keep it heavy on pre prevention, right? We wanna prevent things from happening in the first place. And so what we do there is we have to try to create a culture of respect, inclusivity and representation. So that, that is something I tasked all the coaches and athletic staff with because um, the way the coach goes, so, so the team goes is what I've seen. You know, I think that that's pretty, um, pretty normal. And if you are leading by example, that's, and, and also um, intervening if and when there are issues, no matter how small, that creates a, a good culture um, for students to feel um, that they are being held accountable and that they are on their best behavior. Um, also the, the point of them being a representative of the university as an athlete. So they, they are more representative than other students as they are in public view and, um, and they are going uh, traveling a lot and things like that. And so we just ask that you encourage that and facilitate that. Um, and the other part is always tricky with athletics as far as my experience goes is trying to, to create a culture where the student athletes feel they can report or um, share concerns. Um, I think there's a, the challenge I run into sometimes is there's a real team mentality, which can be fantastic, but also um, it can lead to, I don't wanna report because I'm gonna protect my teammate or I don't wanna be a snitch or things like that. And so just encouraging that and, and creating a safe space for them to do that. Um, because at the end of the day, you all are mandatory reporters. And so you must um, report any disclosures of anything that's happening. So that's why it says kind of any, even any suspected sexual violence in particular, um, you probably won't have all the information at the time. I never get the all the information in my first reports. Um, so you just report what you have and then we hope that it's not something bigger, but if it is, then we're covered and we can start something a little bit more timely. Um, so, um, maintaining, um, that culture would be also challenging behaviors that are problematic, um, no matter what level they, of concern they're at. So sometimes there's issues where they're kind of high level, we're, we're really concerned. Um, and then there's some that we might consider more microaggression or kind of lower level. I think challenging those things at all levels is important and helps to facilitate that culture. Um, and then as far as being in compliance, um, you all are required to report um, any disclosures or any information around sexual violence um, and actually also discrimination, harassment, retaliation. So any bias motivated incident at all um, in any sexual violence motive, uh, incident. Um, that's all part of one policy here at Regis. And we are trying to do a little bit better about the reporting around discrimination and harassment of protected classes. Um, it's something we need to improve on as a whole as a university, um, but it is technically required under our policy. So you are responsible for that. If there's ever an, uh, an incident or an issue where it's like really gray and you're not sure, you can always call me and I'll talk through it with you. I'm happy to do that so we can make a determination um, because you know they're not always so simple, <laughs> you'll find. So again, what you're supposed to report are any, any, is any information or disclosure on sexual misconduct, uh, discrimination of protected class, any retaliation because someone is involved in that. So if you have two athletes that are involved in um, an investigation, one is a respondent and one is a complainant. If you have one of them retaliating against the other, if you have teammates of one retaliating against another, um, that can look like bullying or threats or stalking or just you know, different things that are damaging. Um, that's something we take really seriously and that needs to be reported as well. And I don't know, um, Kate, I, I know you're usually the one that we all go through or athletics goes through to report those things. Mm -hmm. um, and so I always, always will share the link for the reporting form if anyone wants to fill it out. But I think 
Kate, what can you kind of just give some direction on how you want that uh, those reports to be filled out? Um, probably if someone reports something to me, just should probably input the information into that report anyway. And then mm -hmm. you and I would, Carol and I would kind of collaborate on an investigation or whatever you want to call it. So, okay. So um, kind of up and out. Yeah. I mean, it's got to get reported anyway. So let's go through the, you know, yeah. System. Yeah. And I honestly, at the end of the day, if you're the person disclosing or reporting, I'm probably going to reach out to you anyways for just like firsthand information. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it, yeah, if that's the way we can do it, I would prefer that as well. So just filling that out and um, being sure to just let Kate know, uh, maybe copy, paste and send that to her as well. So she gets the same information, but I'll share it with Kate as well. So when we work with it. Mm -hmm. Carol, I have um, a question. How is this related to the Clery Act with reporting? I mean, what's, it sounds so, like it overlaps a little bit. They can overlap a little bit. It's a little tricky. So um, mm -hmm. some things are some things don't overlap. So we have a policy that covers certain things that have um, tend to have actually a lower threshold than some of the Cleary items or the Cleary crimes. And sometimes they overlap really easily. So what I usually do, and and Ed, you can pop in on this too, since you're the Cleary um, expert is if I get a report and, and I'm, I'm fairly, you know, I'm well-trained in what Cleary crimes are and aren't and everything like that. So if I get a report that looks like there's a Cleary crime in it, so it's a crime within jurisdiction and things like that, I, I fill out a, re, a Cleary report to Ed. Um, but that being said, I think you all should as well. It's better to over-report, I think, because then we can kind of go through things um, and make sure everything's covered rather than under-reporting. So I would say fill out both. I know um, Ed has a, a form that I use um, that you can fill out, um, but if you just fill out mine, I'll, I'll share it as well. I would just like to add what's really important as a CSA is that once it's reported to a CSA, it has to, uh, we have two days to be in compliance to put it on a crime log. So mm -hmm. when we get out of compliance, fines now are, over $59,000 per fine, just saying. Please report timely, in a timely manner. <laughs> um, yeah, and so in that being said, it might be best just to go ahead and fill out both. Um, and certainly that's a copy paste situation too, for the most part. Um, there are certain things you have to make sure you include um, for each of those. So a lot of that, over the information overlaps. Um, but better to report it and so that um, it can be included on a crime log in a timely manner. Okay. Any other thoughts or questions around the reporting? All right, so um, education for all student athletes, coaches and staff about sexual violence prevention, intervention and response. So again, the prevention, we talked a little bit about how you can create a good culture. Um, our hopes are that this education is also a preventative measure. Um, and I've shared that education with you all to see what we're training, you can see what we're training your students, athletes on. Um, it is around different policy items and we do focus on certain aspects that tend to be more problematic on college campuses. Um, and then also we go through some bystander intervention training to teach, um, teach people how to intervene um, and stop things from happening. So that can be used in a lot of ways. It can be used for sexual violence prevention, but also kind of like bullying intervention and things like that. And so um, if they see something, there's different tools they have um, to intervene at different levels of comfort. So um, we also include some scenarios so they can kind of practice those things. And they've been having pretty good discussions so far um, in those trainings. And um, let's see. And we also um, we also provide uh, information on resources and what confidential and non-confidential resources are um, on campus, off campus. So they just have as many opportunities um, for support as possible. So the way we approach that training is um, we tell the, the students, okay, this is a training about what is expected of you but also a training about what is here for you, right? So it's 
sort of um, so they can look at it both ways. So it's in a helpful way, but not just like a finger wagging, don't do this way, right? So um, that's what we do. And we do that every year as required. Um, but we also have other programming um, that is ongoing throughout the year that anyone is uh, welcome to go to. And I don't know if Katie's on here yet. Katie, are you here? I am here. So I was, I was hoping, Katie, you could talk a little bit about some of the programming that VAVP offers since you all kind of carry the, the heavy load there, um, but that's available to everyone on campus. Yeah, I'm happy to share about that. Um, so like Carol mentioned, VAVP is charged with sort of the ongoing programming around these kinds of conversations and really just holding space to create awareness, but also have that prevention be the center of what we're doing. Um, so if you all remember seeing the red flags in the quad at the beginning of the year, that was us um, raising awareness around red flags in relationships and we are doing a monthly program around mental health and kind of approaching that through violence prevention lens and holding space to have some peer-to-peer -peer connection. Um, and we also do educational and um, hopefully interesting programming. So we'll do movie nights. Um, we'll also have room for folks to look at media. So like the show you, if y'all are familiar with that, looking at stalking and just kind of breaking that down and really just trying to build understanding around what interpersonal violence looks like, how to recognize it, and even building skills around how to respond, like with those bystander intervention pieces that we included in the training that we're working with your student athletes on now. Um, so feel free to encourage folks to participate. Um, we definitely are seeing folks feeling pretty worn out this semester, which I'm sure you all might be seeing as well, but um, we're definitely an ongoing resource to engage with, not just in the advocacy realm, which I'll speak about what that looks like for me, but also just having space for students to go a little deeper into these kinds of conversations if they choose to. Thanks, Katie. And, and you know, sometimes uh, if I'm working with some students um, or even staff or faculty, because my policy covers everyone, um, education can be part of an outcome. So if there's a sanction or if there's a resolution informally, we can recommend some education and we can do that. Um, through my office, there's some things, maybe there's conversa educational conversations Katie can have possibly. We really tailor things uh, to what is appropriate. Um, we also have some things through the counseling center that are kind of more educational rather than uh, therapy sessions. So those are some things that are available to anyone, but also um, might be implemented. <clears throat> All right, um, so um, we also have to check and make sure we are in compliance with all federal and applicable state regulations related to sexual violence prevention and response. Um, also, you know, you guys are, are having to be in compliance with NCAA guidelines. Um, as far as federal and state, um, I can say that our discrimination, sexual misconduct and retaliation policy um, are in line with that. And so uh, you don't have to be an expert on all the laws. You can just uh, refer to our policy. And then um, we are also um, working on, Kate and I are working on a policy around this Tracy rule. Um, and so that will be forthcoming. I don't, Kate, you can certainly speak to that, but basically it requires disclosure um, by student athletes, whether they are current or prospective to disclose any involvement or accusations um, of um, policy violation at their previous institution or a law violation or things like that. And so there's forms that um, need to be filled out and. Kate, I don't know if there's anything else you want to kind of share about that. That's a new and a, I guess, updated program, and it's it'll start uh, for 22-23 academic year, but it is for current student athletes and any incoming transfers. Just any, I guess, disclose kind of if they've been, I think it's arrested um, for, you know, any sort of. Uh, sexual violence, sexual misconduct crimes. So um, again, that information is forthcoming. Hopefully have more for you in the next, beginning of next semester anyway, so. 
So that's that's happening. That's been fun to work on, but that's another way we're trying to make sure we're in compliance. Um, and so again, just refer to uh, that policy when it is out and um, to, to my policy I referenced, but also any questions around either of those, you can speak with Kate or I. Um, because, you know, as policy goes, sometimes that you read it and you still don't have your questions answered. So, um, because every case is so, uh, so unique. All right. Um, and finally, um, we have to make sure that you all are aware that you are required to cooperate with, but not manage direct control um, or otherwise interfere with our investigations. Um, as far as these allegations uh, go. And so what that means is, first of all, um, you are required to report, of course, and then um, you may be asked to help with interim measures if there are any. So you may be asked to facilitate some things where there's a different schedule for, for working out or something like that. I mean, it could be anything. We Again, it's another thing that we kind of tailor as we go. Um, so we just ask you to do that. You might also be asked to be interviewed if there's an investigation um, to answer some questions and all of that. So we ask that you cooperate in your forthcoming in those events. Um, and let's see here. Otherwise, um, I think it's really important for us to just kind of review a couple things. I think I have the ability to share my screen. So this is um, our flow chart. If you wanna cross your eyes a little bit, um, this is as, as, as nice as I could make it look. So this, these are the things that come to us. Um, they come to me actually. And then we, we, I kind of deal, deal them out as I need to. So we have the formal and informal processes. The formal is um, an investigation and hearing. Informal could be a lot of things, but it could be like, like a mediation. So it's without the investigation. Uh, if I don't have jurisdiction, um, it doesn't mean I can't do anything. So don't make sure you still report. Even if something happened off campus, um, I can still provide resources and get them connected and Katie can do the same. Um, but it's also important for us to know that just for our campus climate um, monitoring. BERT cases, um, this is where we get really low in threshold. So BERT is bias incident response team. We have a team of uh, staff who kind of field these. These are incidents that are bias motivated, but are not otherwise um, reaching threshold as a policy violation. So it might not be severe, pervasive, or objectively offensive enough, but we still want to take an opportunity to make sure we do some education or some conversation. This is a really good big piece of the prevention part. So even if something doesn't feel like it violates, if it's bias motivated, please make sure you do report. Um, Okay. Um, Katie updated this recently, these resources, and they are um, organized by on-campus, off-campus, confidential and not confidential. Um, one thing I always make sure I point out is that this University of Ministry and Jesuits, um, they are confidential, but their peer ministers are not. So they have to report, and that's something that we make sure we share with the students as well, because they're often seen, and that's often a point of confusion. Um, but these are all of our confidential. Um, and Katie is gonna, in a little bit, we're gonna talk a little bit more about what our office is doing. Katie will cover, this is a huge resource, victim advocacy and violence prevention. Um, I work with Katie a lot, even though she's confidential. So sometimes I work with her with students, sometimes they don't want to, and that's fine. We just wanna make sure they get the resources they need. Um, another great resource, especially for any kind of violation or or trouble with bias motivated incidents, Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusive Excellence. Um, the staff there is regularly pretty fantastic about um, talking through those issues in a really sensitive and trauma informed way. Um, and then actually two people on staff there are part of BERT. So they are trained to, to facilitate those conversations. Um, and then off campus, we have our usual um, but I think Katie, you added quite a few, which is fantastic. Um, sorry, I'm scrolling through this in a strange way. Um, one that I wanna make sure I note is Denver Health. Denver Health is someone we have an agreement with as far as SANE exams go, if someone needs one. And we also can get people to the hospital um, 
with either like a taxi voucher or some sort of ride um, app. I'm not sure what exactly we're doing right now or if we have any more information on that, Katie, but that's something we can do. Um, get someone there if they need a ride. Okay. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and for the sake of time, keep going. Um, I'm not gonna go through this too much, but this is the presentation we have for your students, okay? So these are the items that we are focusing on. Um, and we did something similar last year. I think we've changed some, some things up in there, but um, really just a, a wider overview, but also a real focus on how to create a better culture through the what you can do sections here. So you may look through that at your leisure. And if you have questions or concerns, please let me know. Uh, every year I always check in too with Kate to see if there's any problem areas. So if there's anything that seems to be happening um, as a pattern, let us know and we can hit that a little harder in the trainings um, when we need to. Um, and then finally, I have included this um, manual. So this is what I was referring to before um, the sexual violence prevention toolkit. It kind of goes over what it, what we all are are all required of NCA and the SSI. Um, and so that again is not something I'll read to you. <laughs> I'll let you have that as a reference. Um, but then before we end, and I think we might end up ending early if there's not any questions. But um, I wanted to invite Katie to talk a little bit more about her office, and and then I'll talk a little bit more about mine as far as. Um, resources, referrals, and supports that are available to anyone who is, um, whether it's student, staff, or faculty who's experiencing sexual violence or discrimination. Okay, um, so as Carol mentioned, I'm one of the confident, confidential resources on campus, and so if you're in a situation where there's either already been a disclosure or maybe you're just getting a sense that there might be something going on for a student connected to interpersonal violence. So that would be either sexual violence, relationship violence or stalking. My office can be a good first stop just in the sense that students can have a sense of safety around being able to explore their options before making a decision. So being able to decide, okay, what are the pros and cons for me if I do wanna report up to Title IX, for example, um, and just holding space for those things. And again, one of the nice things about my office as well is that if there's substances, if substances are involved, that's not gonna shift how or if support is offered to folks. So that can be another kind of thing to share with folks if you do know that substances are involved because oftentimes students are concerned that there might be a conduct issue popping up or those sorts of things. And again, avoid seeking support or getting access to resources. Um, another thing that's nice about advocacy is that I can offer support around navigating academics. And so knowing that student athletes have even more pressure around managing their athletic commitments and academics, we can kind of talk through ways that we can roll out some measures to create some space and um, hopefully take some pressure off if anybody is navigating some of these experiences and trauma. Um, and in addition to that, I'm somebody that can connect folks to resources, whether that's on or off campus. And um, as Carol mentioned, our resource list is pretty expansive as we were scrolling through that, you probably saw that. And some folks may kind of feel better working with someone off campus and feeling like there's more separation, for example. So maybe the team isn't aware if they're not feeling comfortable sharing that or those sorts of things. And just again, trying to create as much agency and choice after having this kind of an experience um, and even navigating the criminal legal system if there is um, participation with law enforcement and court proceedings. So I'm able to offer accompaniment and just again, kind of talk through how to navigate those things with support. And um, I'm happy to chat about any specific questions anyone might have around that. So are there any questions about the advocacy role or confidentiality for my office? Mm 
Okay. Um, and then just so you all know where I am on campus, I'm over in the student center. And so I'm on the second floor just across from the diversity office. Um, and I also have a textable line, so that could be something to share with folks. Again, if you're maybe kind of getting the feeling like something shifted for an athlete on your team, but they're not necessarily feeling ready to tell you, that could be something to offer and just say, hey, there's a confidential resource here. And I found that some students feel more comfortable engaging by text versus an email or call or even coming in person. Um, and with that as well, like if you're traveling, for example, and a disclosure happens, I'm happy to meet with folks virtually too. Um, so that could be a way to get connected more quickly if needed. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I think that's kind of the general overview. And again, if you have questions and they might not pop up right now, you're welcome to reach out to me anytime. And I'm happy to be a support to you all, as well as you're navigating things if things do pop up throughout the year. Thank you, Katie. Um, all right, so I'll talk a little bit more about some things that my office can do that can hopefully be helpful. Um, so my office is not confidential I, because I'm ultimately the person that needs these things to get reported to. So I, I suppose I'm like peak not confidential, but that doesn't mean I share information. I'm very, I keep people's information very protected and private. Um, it just means that if I need to loop someone in, so again, if it's a student athlete, I'm gonna loop um, Kate in, I might loop conduct in, we don't, you know, it's, I'm allowed to do that basically. Um, whereas Katie would be restricted in that information. Um, so what that means is that I, I need to facilitate a process for anyone involved um, whether they are a complainant or a respondent, so someone who is bringing a complaint or someone who's accused of a violation, um, my role is to make sure that they get everything they need, including any supports they might need while they're going through the process, as it is very stressful. Um, and so that all to say, I don't think that I only would provide these resources to one side. Um, I can provide leniency letters. It's something I do quite a bit. Um, to faculty, and it's just really a, a request for faculty to work with a student when they're going through some um, difficult circumstances. So it's not something to change the nature of the course, but it might be, hey, this person needs an excused absence one day, or hey, um, can this person have like a, a two day extension on this paper? You know, it's very, again, very specific to whatever it is. And ultimately faculty can say yes or no to that. But it's just something that helps um, students so that they don't have to disclose and redisclose information um, that they either aren't comfortable in the first place with or they have to keep saying it and it's traumatizing and re-traumatizing. Um, it's something that helps with that. Um, I can do other supportive measures like no contact directives between parties without any kind of investigation. That's something I can do. I can, I can do a lot of supportive things as long as they don't um, remove any rights our access from anyone. Um, I can do a lot of things before we go into a formal process. So that might also be like a, someone is gonna change where they live um, or something like that, right? So we do what we can, it's, it's person by person. Um, and so I really need to engage with that person to see what it is they need and want and what we can do. Um, so those are all in place. Um, I also, I also will refer people to appropriate resources. I've walked students to the counseling center um, I've referred them to Katie um, and um, any other supports that they feel they need. So um, it's again, really um, tailored. Um, otherwise, my role is just to make sure that things go smoothly and everyone has their rights throughout a process um, and they get a fair and equitable hearing and investigation. And so, um, that's what I do here. I always, I, we source our investigations out to investigators who are generally attorneys that work as investigators. Um, and they are also neutral, they're just fact finders. And they provide that information to us so we can do our process. Um, otherwise, I work with Katie a lot as far as um, trying to get some education going. She, she obviously carries the lion's share of that with her, with her peer educators. Um, but I also work with Katie if and when a student decides or, or a faculty or staff decides they want to go through a formal process. Katie helps facilitate and serves as a great support and helps um, 
helps people understand the processes that are available to them. So, um, so that's my role and what I do. And I'm just always here if there's any questions or concerns, um, or if you want to talk through a scenario or a situation where you're not sure, um, please don't hesitate to do that. I'm, I'm accessible and I'm, I'm more than happy to, to help with anything. Um, so any questions about kind of the differences between Katie's office and mine? We are not in the same office. <laughs> um, so uh, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't work out very well if we were, if one's confidential and one isn't. So, um, but we do work together a lot. So any questions around what we do um, in our offices? No, I, I don't have a question, but um, Andy, I'm gonna ask you to just explain your role and part of, it could be part of the process or is part of the process. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I am a, an official Title IX advisor um, here on campus. So essentially all these resources that Carol and Katie are talking about, I'm just another one of those resources, um, specifically to the person that may be accused of something. Um, I typically work on that end, specifically with that individual. So if he or she or they need to be um, any sort of guidance. Um, I'm obviously very familiar with this process that Carol's discussing of how things work. So I'm there to answer any of their questions, mainly because our athletes, I'm a face they know. Um, so maybe they're a little more comfortable coming to me and talking to me if they need accommodations made for academics or scheduling, like a, again, everything she's talked about. I'm just there as a liaison to kind of help um, guide them and work with Carol and her office or Katie and her office and making sure that um, your athletes are being represented and they have someone that they can come to. I can attend those hearings when we bring in the fact finders or those independent investigators. Um, and I have and I will continue to go to them if they want me to, um, just so I'm another set of ears. I'm not there advocating for them. I'm not representing them in any way. I'm really just sitting there listening because as you could imagine in that scenario, it's very overwhelming for a young adult. Um, so I'm just there as another person of set of ears so that when we leave, they can debrief. I can say, yes, that is what they said. No, that's not what they said. You know, those type things. I'm truly just an advisor um, in that situation that can provide resources and an ear and a resource for them. So um, you may or may not know that your student athlete is in a situation. Um, but if you do know and you know they may be struggling, you can ask them if they've reached out to have an advisor and refer them to me um, as their advisor if they feel comfortable having that. Thank you, Andy. Um, and I, we have a list of trained advisors. Otherwise, um, as we have to have an advisor for hearings, uh, each party must have one. So in the event that they don't choose one, we would choose one for them um, from that list, but we train them um, if they are feeling, so if, if perhaps Andy is um, advising one party and there's another party in athletics, if they need to be referred to that list, I'm happy to, to help with that too, um, so. Yeah, and it's, a, it's a wide variety of lists. I mean, it ranges from staff to, to faculty to adjuncts to mm -hmm. across the board. So there, there's probably someone on there that they would feel comfortable with. For sure. And I've had great success with them so far in, in what, who we've used. They've been fantastic. So I'm really happy with with how those have gone. Um, so, yeah, just just always ask questions <laughs> or ask for what you need or encourage your your athletes to do the same. Um, because but we do try to do what we can and each case is unique. So it's not just going to be always the same answer for, for everything. Um, so please do that. Um, any thoughts or questions or anything else that I'm missing, Kate? Yeah, can you just kind of explain, um, I guess, disclosure or not to a coach regarding a complaint that's filed and how that works? So if a, if a student or an athlete or really anyone discloses 